He's had a very accomplished life, uh, as many of you uh, know very well from your own personal experiences with Mladen, as we know as members of the center, uh, of which he became a very valued uh, member, both as a student and then as an alumnus. Um, so in, a, in many ways, this is a very um, appropriate occasion, I believe, to um, celebrate all of his achievements, everything that he has done, uh, both in terms of academic achievements, but also in terms of uh, relationships with people, because I think this uh, you will hear over and over again uh, when our speakers will be saying a few words about Mladen, um, his generosity, his kindness, um, just the fantastic, wonderful person that he was. So without further ado and not many more tears, I would ask uh, Antje Bude, whom I also wanted to thank very much for um, bringing us all together, uh, to introduce our speakers. Hello, everyone. Um, usually, you know, in such occasion, you wouldn't say you are delighted, but I am to have you all here uh, to celebrate Mladen. Uh, for me, it was a true shock when I learned that he passed. I just, I still can't really believe this, you know. I hear his voice. Um, I see his image, and it's just so sad. But we have people here today who knew him well, who worked with him, <coughs> and who have stories to share. And I, um, I would like to start with Domenico Pietro Paolo, uh, who was the supervisor of his uh, brilliant uh, PhD thesis, to start. And in the spirit of celebration, as his thesis supervisor, I would like to celebrate his academic accomplishments and uh, what we shared uh, in, uh, during the time that he was writing his PhD thesis. In the past little while, since I first learned of Madden's death, I have often rehearsed in my mind the things by which we were brought together at the Drama Center, going over questions that we talked about and the many interests that we shared. Thesis supervision is largely a matter of mutual selection on the basis of shared interests. That we had significant interests in common first became apparent to me when Mladen told me about traces of the Venetian Commedia dell'arte tradition in the different theatrical cultures of the Dalmatian coast, and when we first spoke of the use of humor as an instrument of criticism and change. Most of all, however, we talked about sound about its nature, its perception, its susceptibility to deformation, its signifying power, and its aesthetic appeal. That was a long time ago, when Mladen was still taking graduate courses and preparing for his comprehensive examinations. Eventually, one of our conversations led him to his thesis topic, which was the dramaturgy of sound in futurist performance. And as soon as we decided that this was indeed going to be his area of study and that I would be his supervisor, Mladen became enthusiastic and spirited about even minor aspects of the production of sound and about its perception, jumping from one detail to the other with the excitement of one who knows that he is on the edge of a significant accomplishment. While Mladen was working on his thesis, we met regularly to talk about each of these details, sometimes calmly and scientifically, at other times quick, quickly and playfully, but always with great pleasure. In some conversations, we virtually personified sound, treating it as if it were a potential dialogue partner, <coughs> someone that we could interrogate about the behavior, about his behavior and his secret motivations, and not simply as the vocal medium through which we in our own dialogue, we're engaging at that moment. Mladen moved with ease between the material and the metaphorical domains of sound, between its physicality and its interpretation, in a manner that was, that was both serious and jovial. For that reason, between rigorous, rigorous discussions about conceptual and textual details, we chuckled much, pleased with ourselves, in our joint pursuit of the same idea, 
and pleased to be in each other's company. Looking back now on those conversations, I realize what I did not realize then, that what we were doing was we were celebrating our own growing friendship quietly and privately and always in an unassuming manner. Our last conversation was at the funeral of a mutual friend, Christopher Innes, for whom we, as well as others in this room, had much affection. But even then, we found time to talk about sound, because it was under Christopher's expert supervision in a postdoctoral appointment at York University that Mladen transformed his PhD thesis into a seminal book about the dramaturgy of sound in avant-garde and post-dramatic theater, a work that charts out new territories for younger scholars of theatrical sound. If it is true, as some philosophers tell us, that for long periods of our lives, we let ourselves be dominated by a single thought, a thought around which all others gravitate and from which the mind itself takes orientation, I have no doubt that for Mladen, that thought was the materiality of sound. Mladen understood acoustic materiality as a quality that locates sound somewhere between the domains of real and metaphorical physicality and that renders it susceptible to molding and model modeling in the manner both of both abstract logic and concrete plastic arts. For Mladen, whether it is the product of an intelligible voice or that of an unparaphrasable vocal gesture, whether it is generated by traditional musical instruments or futurist noisemakers, sound could be so manipulated as to give rise in the mind of the audience to the impression that it is a sculpted oral object with the status of an, invis of an invisible dramatic protagonist. Mladen intuited this very early in his studies. And he knew, perhaps from having reflected at length on his own distinguished work in radio, that the fusion of sculpture and acoustics can occur with aesthetic and cognitive significance only in the technological imagination and it is to the study of the theater of that imagination that he dedicated his best intellectual effort. His book, I believe, is destined to have an enduring impact on research in that field for many years. I would like to conclude my remarks by addressing Bidiana and her family personally. It is with profound sense of human solidarity that I ask you to accept my condolences from Latin's passing. I hope that in his final moments he did not suffer much and that he was at peace when he left this world. As you mourn his passing, I hope that you can find some comfort in the thought that his accomplishments as a scholar are widely recognized and continue to enrich the lives of many others in the field, students and teachers alike, and myself included. Mladen has left a big empty space behind him as a husband, as a father, as a friend, but also, I add, as a scholar, and as the gentle and wise human being that he was. And we shall all miss him for a very long time. If I may appropriate a line from Euripides in a manner that I think Mladen would have liked, I will conclude these remarks by saying, may the earth lie quietly on his body, as the voice of his spirit resonates in our memory. Thank you. Thank you, Domenico. Uh, next is John Astington, or dear colleague. Would you like to come up with you, John? Thank you. And we'll also share some of his thoughts. Martin Novaggio was a remarkable individual whom I consider it a privilege to have known and worked with. We were more or less contemporaries but the trajectory and achievements of the first part of his career in Europe were very different from mine. I left the UK over 50 years ago, and I've never ventured outside the confines of academic institu institutions to find real work. Mladen, you could say, reinvented himself as a scholar in his 50s with eminent success. But to put it that way isn't particularly exact. The skill and subtlety of the work he conducted at the University of Toronto, at York University as a postdoc, 
and its subsequent fruition in publications were qualities he brought with him when he came here. Older students generally, of course, can bring to their academic work the advantages of experience, pleasant and unpleasant. Martin had known both. They, might, they also might be less inclined to indulge that favorite graduate school pastime, beating about the bush, a sin to which I might plead guilty. More particularly in Latin's case, one felt oneself in the presence of a born intellectual, someone who thought deeply and widely about the significance of anything to which he turned his attention, and who sought precise and elegant solutions to questions, deriving evident pleasure from the entire process. Thinking was his element, and I can't conceive that his other work in radio and sound production was undertaken with any less care and reflectiveness. <coughs> that, walk, that work, after all, underlay the writing of his thesis and the book based on it, Dramaturgy of Sound in the Avant-Garde and Post-Dramatic Theatre. You may detect that I was rather in awe of Martin. He knew many things I didn't, and he was formidable in argument when he felt one was missing the point. <coughs> That said, he was at the same time modest, charming, and warm, and enjoyed a joke as much as I do. The last time I saw him significantly was over a beer, last fall, when he joked about his intention to hang on to existence. He was about to leave to Sarai for Sarajevo to visit his family there. <clears throat> I've said that we were contemporaries in age, we were also contemporaries in the Graduate Center, in that he began his studies there in the year that I began, became its full-time director. And when I retired from that post five years later, Mladen had finished all the required preliminaries for writing his doctoral thesis. I must indeed have in, discussed his admission to the program with other faculty members at the center, though I confess I can't now remember having done so. We may have felt we'd give him a probationary period, given his unusual background. But any doubts about his suitability were dispelled once he established his presence in graduate seminars. In that context, he and I didn't in fact see much of each other. I teach in the early modern period, and Mladen's interests lay largely elsewhere. I did, however, encounter him as a member of the senior group I advised on the sitting of the comprehensive exams and the preparation of the thesis proposal, when the intellectual qualities I've described became quite apparent to me, and when we cemented a continuing collegial friendship. I'm most proud of having helped, however modestly, in seeing Mladen's remarkable and original book manuscript into print. Professor Christopher Innes, of whom Domenico spoke, with whom Laden was then working, asked me to become a reader for McGill Queen's University Press. Though no expert in the period, I agreed to assess it from the wider perspective of theatre and performance history. The press's editor and I agreed that it was a truly groundbreaking and enlightening study, with only the very slight pockmarks of Laden's Slavic inflected English occasionally apparent. How infuriating the unwritten constitution about our definite and indefinite articles must be <laughs> for anyone with distinct native linguistic instincts. Such minor matters can be and were fixed, and I was delighted to see the book with its strikingly handsome color appear six years ago. That publication, a major contribution to the study of modernist and postmodernist theater, will be one monument from love. Our collective memories of him will be another. To those who know him best, his family and close friends, we offer our sympathy and comfort. A fine man whose individuality we shall each remember in distinct ways, but we shall all miss him. Um, I now introduce Pia Cleaver, uh, who is the only person I know from our faculty who actually traveled with Milan at least twice. It's 
very sad and said, I come out of a class and thought, God, did I learn a lot. I totally appreciate it. It's always very quiet, but very intelligent intervention, challenging me and his continued discussion after class. He was a dream student. He was a teacher. And I was fortunate, we were fortunate to travel together. I took the students to Quebec City to see Robert Lepage's uh, Dragon's Trilogy, and Viviana and Vladen joined us. And it was very nice, Robert Lepage uh, uh, waited for us, showed us his theater, and then we saw the six hour play. Now whoever traveled with students knows how wonderful it is to have two adults with you <laughs> who can keep the students in line, who engage them in interesting discussions, and are just there to comfort basically me. I just cherished my memory with him very, very much. And I didn't forget. Thank you. Thank you, Pia. Last but not least, Stephen Johnson, uh, who also served on Mladen's committee, but he also did something else very exciting with Mladen. I did. Thank you, Antje. Thank you. Um, like my colleagues, uh, I knew Mladen through this university as his teacher, lecturer, in the PhD program. We learned theory together. He taught me as much as I taught him. Actually, he may have taught me more, but. <coughs> and as a member of his committee, and as a colleague, and as a friend. Uh, he was a kind, generous, a creative man with a keen intelligence, a quiet strength, and an excellent, I mean, really excellent sense of humor. But you, you already knew that. Yeah, I, I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. We'll trade stories later. But I also know him Latin in another way. I knew him as my producer, my director, my dramaturge, my creative collaborator, my mentor, and my teacher. That's a lot. I knew him as all of these things before I ever arrived at this university. He had a profound influence on me. And that's what I want to pay tribute to. In the 1990s, when I was teaching at McMaster University, I brought a small production down to the Festival of Original Theatre uh, here in the center. Uh, it was based on a play I wrote, in turn based on my own research as an academic on a 19th century dancer. Shortly after that presentation, I was contacted by one Mladen Ovagia, who I did not know, asking to meet with me to talk about turning my play into a radio <coughs> drama for the CBC. I read it like that and pause for a moment to reflect because you have to understand I was reading this message saying someone wanted to talk with me about creating a radio drama out of a play whose central figure was a voiceless dancer. Okay, he was a tap dancer, but nevertheless. <laughs> You can understand, perhaps, my hesitation. Of course, when I met Mladen, uh, it took about a minute for him to convince me with his enthusiasm, his imaginative intelligence, and his so clear to see knowledge of the art that this was a great idea. Apparently, the fact that I had never written a radio play, okay, play, was not a problem for him. He could deal with that. And so began one of the best creative and collaborative experiences of my life, bar none. I got to spend an entire summer with Mladen, sitting on sunny patios over beer, poring over and rewriting a script, talking through every word, every sound, every scene, receiving a complete, private, personal, extended tutorial in the art of the radio drama. And then, after that extraordinarily rich experience, he made certain that I could be present at the taping of the final performance. Of course, at first, typically, 
While I sat across from Aladdin, working and worrying that script into existence, I had no idea that I was sitting across from one of the acknowledged master craftsmen of the form, someone with a world of international experience. It only became clear over time as he talked with me in what I know you all know was that clear, calm, soft, encouraging voice, never less than in full collaboration, but never less than firm and strong-willed in what needed to be done to make it better. It became particularly clear in production. As I watched Maladin work with the actors, manage all the nuances of tempo, the mixing of voices, all live, all at once, and all in the interests of the playwright, I have to say, which was extraordinary. He even made certain that the choreographer for the original stage play that I had done was incorporated into the production and received a credit. And I think it says a great deal about Maladin's belief both in experimentation and in collaboration that this, that, that, that this example of his work, a radio drama, had a credited choreographer. So Maladin was to me what I know he was to so many others in his many years of service to the art, dramaturge, producer, director, collaborator. But it's important for me to add one more word. On the patios and in the studio, I had the great good fortune to spend time as Maladin's student. He was a wonderful teacher whose empowering manner stayed with me and became an important part of my own teaching afterwards. Well, my teaching goals, at least. On my best days, I teach Let Maladin. <laughs> like everyone else, I celebrate his life here. As I mourn it, I also celebrate it. And we are all a part of his legacy. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Stephen. I said you're here anymore, but uh, oh, I just had a slightly different, uh, long time experience with Nada Havadi and Bilyan and Perla and Yelena. Uh, what year did you come? Was it 92, 93? You are the first Toronto house that we came to. <laughs> so it was I, two days after we left. I picked up the phone and he said, hi, is this Judith Cohen? And I said, yes. And he said, you don't know me, I'm Ladin Ovadia. And I heard your name from the Sephardic Jewish community of Bosnia and I've read your articles. I'm, a, a special, I'm an ethnomusicologist and a singer and I specialize in Sephardic music. And so I said, well, come on over for supper. And he said, well, you know, I have, I'm not alone. I have a wife and I have two children. And I said, okay, fine. Do you have anyone else? You know, start with them and do whoever else. And, and so Laden and Viliana and Perla and Yelena, you were pretty small then, Yelena, came over for supper. My daughter was quite little, and I remember Perlina, uh, Perla getting down on the floor and giving my daughter a piggyback ride on the floor. And um, Laden gave me a lot of information, of course, about the Bosnian Sephardic community, and we shared a lot of interest in that aspect of his, of his life and his family. And I'm just going to, I talked with Biliana about possibly doing this, I'm going to sing you a, a Bosnian, Zebdalinka, <coughs> and Laden transcribed the words for me. I had a tape that was sent to me by Ankisa Petrovic, a wonderful Bosnian ethnomusicologist who worked with the Jewish community in Sarajevo. And I called up Laden and I said, I'm going to learn how to sing these songs, but I don't understand all the words. I had traveled to former Yugoslavia back in 1970, actually, and I'd been to Bosnia then and back in the late 70s and so on. And so he came over and sat and transcribed the song for me. And it's an old, old Sevdalinka uh, about love and, and longing. And anyone here who is Bosnian, if I make any mistakes in pronunciation, please forgive me. <laughs> Nitje 
Years ago, I used to work in training in Serbia. I'm only young sailor. There's nobody. Only his darling girl. Wait for him. 